Good afternoon. I, I got the instruction to begin this session on time so we could finish on time, and I'm very stickler for time. So we have our last panel for, uh, for the day. Uh, for those who were with us from yesterday and today, this is the, will be the final panel, panel four. And the title of the panel is Adaptation, uh, Recasting of Islamic Norms and Practices in Local Legal Environment. And we have three great speakers uh, that will elucidate on the title of the panel. We have first uh, John Bowen uh, from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, his research is concerned primarily with the role of cultural forms in the process of social change. Uh, after him, we have Dino Obozovic from the University of Sarajevo. Uh, his research interests include human rights, culture, the process of democratization in post-conflict societies, sociologies of, sociology of knowledge, and sociology of religion. And uh, last but not least, we'll have Alexander uh, Cairo uh, from Utrecht University. Uh, his current research deals with the contemporary Muslim debate on Islamic normativity and authority in Western Europe. So each speaker will speak 20 minutes, and then at the end we'll have about 15 minutes of question and, uh, question and answer. John, please. I'm speaking from over here even though I don't have a PowerPoint just because we just had lunch. I can't stand the idea of sitting around, sitting down. From, you have to sit down, however. Um, now I come to uh, this particular panel from many years of work in Indonesia, followed by many, much work in France, and now a new project which asks um, how, what happens when you, you have um, Muslims moving into a number of states where there are not the sorts of Islamic institutions on which they might wish to depend. You have very different uh, local uh, legal cultures, and the Muslims moving in bring with them all sorts of very diverse ideas and practices. It's not, it's not Islam, but very different sorts of histories. So in, in each of several countries, what sorts of demands arise from Muslims? How are these dealt with? And what kinds of justifications are given for, uh, for new practices? Uh, I've, I'm looking at this, it's a broader project, uh, starting by looking at France, I England, and the United States. And uh, there's a longer paper where I highlight some of the key uh, contrasts. Uh, on the one hand, the, uh, the strong effect of public order uh, thinking in France, um, pushing people, Muslims and uh, uh, jurists, to think about ways that uh, civil law institutions can be seen as already sufficient. Uh, in the United States, uh, a very narrow set of demands um, focusing on the enforceability of contracts uh, that, that Asifa already, already described. And then finally in the UK, a different history which has encouraged the uh, emergence of community-specific institutions because of features about immigration, because of the way in which the UK has, um, has pushed money through uh, community organizations. And in the 1980s, this saw the emergence of, of Sharia uh, councils. Um, I've started working today, and I'm only going to talk uh, about England and only about a, a very little part of it. I've started work with, with one uh, in Leighton, east of London, which uh, once a month meets with other Muslims uh, in a room next to the large Regent's Park Mosque in, in central London. And there they review case files, which are uh, almost entirely requests for divorce coming from, from women. These scholars come from Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Palestine, and they also draw on colleagues who are from Somalia, Sudan, and elsewhere. Uh, among themselves, they de deliberate in English, Arabic, and sometimes in Urdu, depending on who is uh, at the table. Each of these cases presents its own problems, but most involve transnational journeys. And just to give you a sense, this is not just an England matter. At the February 2008 monthly meeting, the council considered seven cases, all wives' petitions for divorce. The women had been born in Pakistan, Somalia, and Mauritius. One had married in Abu Dhabi, another in Yemen, and the husbands were living in Italy, Pakistan, Mauritius, and in two cases, places unknown. In all cases, the council either dissolved the marriage or asked for further information to determine the husband's whereabouts. Well, a number of interesting issues come up with respect to the terms of trade, what I'm calling the terms of trade, between these councils and uh, the civil courts. I'm not going to talk about those. The panel uh, uh, emphasis is really on reconsiderations of, of, of Sharia, but I do have a piece in the uh, 
uh, the March-April issue of the Boston Review, which is online, where I go through more of the back and forth between the civil courts and the, um, and the Sharia Council. So I'm going to focus on deliberations among uh, ulama, they don't call themselves qadi, uh, these scholars about uh, how to think about Islam in particular uh, cases. So one of the questions is, do they manage to transplant a set of practices and procedures from elsewhere into the English context? Would be divorce uh, norms and practices traveling? Or do they have to sometimes uh, create a new set of norms and fit them to English conditions? Uh, both are obviously true, but it's sort of two competing sets of working hypotheses. Because most Muslims came to Britain from South Asia, uh, and as, this includes most on the Sharia councils, we might expect them to have taken uh, norms and decisions from the Hanafi school as interpreted in, in South Asia and to apply them to England. But two factors complicate this possible scenario. First, not all the South Asian scholars see the Islamic world in uh, Hanafi terms. In fact, the leading scholar on the Leighton Council, uh, Suhib Hassan, he, he's, from, uh, he's from South Asia, but he considers himself of the Alul Hadith school. That is, he emphasizes the Hadith uh, over uh, any particular school of fiqh, including Hanafi. That's one factor that prevents a simple transplantation. Secondly, although numerically preponderant, South Asians do not make up the entirety of Muslims of, of, of Britain. And I, as I said, uh, these Muslims who uh, deliberate come from, come from all over. But they do draw on their own repertoires of norms, traditions, and concerns about the situation in England. Thus, and here's the critical part, when these, these ulama deliberate, they reason in a dialectical way between on the one hand, what they have brought to England, and on the other hand, what they encounter in their meetings with English Muslim families. Their provisional syntheses take the form of pronouncement on Islamic law for England in particular cases. So I want to give a case in which one scholar, happens to be Suheb Hassan, can draw on a rather straightforward repertoire of Islamic rules to try and shape the behavior of Muslims living in England. And then I want to turn to a, a, a dialogue between two of these, two of these scholars. Suib Hassan, for reasons I don't yet, I'm at the beginning of this project, uh, so I, I don't under, completely understand the reasons yet, but he tends to focus on the need to pressure husbands into acting correctly. For, exa for example, his counsel always starts by urging the husband to deliver a talak, even if the wife initiated the action. They'll say, well, fine, but if you'll just give a talak, it'll be all over, which benefits her. To do, the, uh, to do this, the husband must fill out, sign, and have witnessed a talak nama on which he agrees to pay the mahar in full along with, uh, with a muta'a, a small uh, payment sometimes called a divorce remedy. In the, in, in, that's the term used here. This, now I'm quoting from, from Suheb Hassan. But most of the time, we end up dissolving the marriage because of his pride. The men rarely are willing to grant the divorce if the woman initiated the proceedings. If he initiates, we send him a talak nama. We issue it to make sure the wife gets her mahar back, all of it if the marriage was consummated, and half of it, half if it was not. So it gives us some leverage over the husband. The husband wants the talak nama because he may need a paper to prove he was divorced. This is critical, of course. Now, the scholars can flexibly interpret various terms of this set of claims I just read to put pressure on men to behave in accord with English expectations. It's the interesting part. So let me read you uh, Suheb Hassan's explanation of a, of a case. In a case, I'm quoting him, in a case we decided recently, the couple had married in Karachi. He had been living in England and went back there to get a wife. His parents were pressuring him to marry this girl. They were upset he was dating girls and Muslim parents will get upset and find a wife, but he did not want her. When they came to us, he said they had not consummated the marriage, and so she was due only one half the mahar. But she said they had consummated it. Well, some scholars wrote that if the couple is in khalwat, isolation, and could have touched each other's bodies, then that constitutes consummation. And we ruled that such was the case, and that she was due the entire amount. All right, well, then I asked a question. I'm an anthropologist, and our role is to ask uh, pesky, irritating questions. So me. Uh, but surely other scholars said the opposite. So why did you choose this opinion? Suheb Hassan, well what, he was, well, what was he doing marrying her if he did not want to do so? He had already married another woman by the time she came to us, never wanted her. England is about to pass a new law against forced marriages, which will penalize parents if they force a girl, it's usually girls, to marry, meaning that they did not want the marriage. Because in those cases, the marriage rarely works out. It must be in the heart to work. It must be, as they say here, a love marriage. All right, so by interpreting rules for how to determine the consummation of a marriage in the particular way he did, the council, in this case Suheb, is able to, first of all, maximally award mahar to wives, 
Second, structure the incentives so as to add a bit, one more reason not to engage in this kind of please the parents marriage described here. And third, to anticipate the direction of English law, which, which is in his advantage in his negotiations for more uh, judicial room. Of particular interest, and consistent with many such other instances, is that Hassan justifies his selection of this view of consummation, not in terms of Islamic first principles, allegiance to a particular legal school, or a particular methodology of fiqh, but rather in terms of his own ethical view of the behavior of the young husband. What was he doing marrying her if he did not want to do so? This comment has nothing to do with judging the likelihood of consummation or choosing among alternative scholarly opinions, although that's how he publicly justified it, but rather imputes improper motives to the husband and indirectly to his parents and judges it appropriate to punish him by granting all the mahar to the wife. All right, now second example, and this reflects that the fact that the scholars don't always agree, and one of my tasks is going to be to sort of unpack what they're bringing to the table, each of, of the six or eight who sit down together. Another member of the council, the Palestinian Haitham al-Haddad, generally looks to safeguard the interests of the husband, particularly with regard to visit, the right to visit the children after a divorce. Indeed, most, most of these scholars disapprove of the way the civil courts tend to automatically award custody to the mother. Both Suheb and Haitham took active roles in the deliberation held in the end of May 2008 concerning a couple now living in separate countries, she in London, where she was born, and he in Pakistan, his country of birth. They had married in Pakistan and had been separated since 2001. She's going ahead with a civil divorce in England. Indeed, this council requires that there be a civil divorce proceeding initiated before they will consider the, the case formally. The issue before the council was whether to give her a religious divorce or tell her to go get a divorce in Pakistan, where they were married. Several judges assume, perhaps correctly, that if they dissolve her marriage, she would go to the English civil courts to obtain custody of her children, who are now aged seven and nine. And incidentally, this is what women uh, almost always do. They, they use the civil courts for those issues. Hassan, uh, uh, Suheb, and, and, Hith, and uh, Haitham take different sides. And so I'm going to quote a bit of their exchange. Suheb. It has been seven years. Give her a divorce. High thumb. Let her go to Pakistan for the divorce. It's not a big issue. Now, there's an Egyptian lawyer who's lived in London for a long time, and he's sitting in as a guest. He's often there. It is a big issue. They'll favor the man because they'll say, she escaped the marriage. Suheb. But women do not want to move there, nor will children who grew up in London wish to move to Pakistan. High thumb. That's not the only consideration. Suheb. Usually, if a woman goes to Pakistan to marry, the assumption is they both will come to the UK. In this case, he wanted to come here, but couldn't get a visa. Haitham, let her apply to the Pakistan courts. She's trying to use us to get the children. The Egyptian lawyer from the sidelines now. No, she's not using you. She feels more comfortable here. I'm trying to be Egyptian when it's here. <laughs> the English judges won't let the kids move to Pakistan because she will convince the judge that the father would never let the kids return. How'd I do? <laughs> Suhib. She must assure us that she will not keep the children from traveling to Pakistan if they wish to. The issue on one issue, wish on which they, they agree. We have to help her because the separation has been so long. I thought, no, she was happy once, then she left and abducted the children, if I may exaggerate a little. They finished up by agreeing that Haitham would interview the wife in London, but he insists on interviewing both of them, and they joked that they should send Haitham to Pakistan because he's so annoying and persistent that he would be able to convince the husband to give a talaq. That's the joking part. Okay. Hassan and Haitham agree that the issue in England will be to assure that the husband in Pakistan won't lose his ties to his children, but they're working with two very different narratives about the marriage. For Suhem Hassan, it's evident that the wife went to Pakistan to marry and return with her husband, and eventually children, to England, because that's what such couples usually do, as he said. The husband created the problem by not following her, and now the council should set her free so she can get on with her life in England with her children. For Haitham al-Haddad, the normal story would have been that the happy couple settles in Pakistan. In this case, however, the wife left with the children and now is trying to strategically use the English courts. It's the council's role to assure that justice is done for the children's father. Well, it may be the case that uh, Hassan's tendencies come from the important role played by judicial khula in Pakistan, where he developed his sense of Islamic law and which remains in his mind as a major sphere of of reference. And there have been a series of key judicial decisions through the 1980s in Pakistan where judges ruled that wives had the right to ask for dissolution of their marriage as a khula when the marriage uh, seemed to be unable to, to continue. This case shows the double transnational character of the reasoning and deliberative processes engaged in at council meetings. First, the marriages and divorces 
and, and the actual potential remarriages, themselves take place across state boundaries and thus bring into play multiple legal systems and multiple probabilities of accepting a council decree. Indeed, Soeb Hassan worries a lot about whether authorities in Pakistan will accept a piece of paper that comes out of the council as attesting to the woman's a proper uh, divorce from her husband. There's a second transnational character, which is the scholars themselves have come to England from other places, and to a greater or lesser degree, their pre-England years shape what they do in England today. Now, despite this attention to English context, the council emphasizes that the sacred law, as they, they, they talk about it, does not itself change. They themselves select from among alternative interpretations to arrive at a workable solution. They also, but they also oppose those who would innovate in matters settled by revelation. In doing, they seek to retain their credibility with Muslims in England and Muslims in Pakistan and other places too, perhaps, who attack this and other councils as illegitimate and is likely to water down Sharia. And Suhib receives lawyer, uh, uh, letters from lawyers in Pakistan who say, you know, who the heck do you think you are uh, uh, coming up with these decisions? So uh, when, for example, there's a Muslim institute in London in, in last August, it published a model uh, marriage contract, uh, which sounded a little bit like, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the Pakistani proposition to allow the woman to initiate a divorce on equal grounds with the, uh, with, with the man. And it was endorsed by another Sharia council, indeed the oldest one in, in Ealing, the one founded in 1985. Um, but the Leighton Council denounces the methods by which this marriage council arrived, uh, 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 this, uh, sorry, Muslim Institute produced this contract as, as being sort of taking from here and there as it pleases you, rather than having a consistent application of the law, and so this is their grounds for publicly opposing it. But on, yet on other matters, the council does select among alternative opinions rather than following one, uh, one school. Let me just give you a brief example, five minutes. Um, one issue that comes up that's already come up in our discussions is the status of a triple talak said all at once, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Um, the, uh, the, the, the question comes up for the council, um, and according to Suheb Hassan again, the, uh, the, the, um, the four madahib have ruled and uh, that the, tr the three talaks said at once count as, as all three. So the marriage is, uh, is over at that point. Uh, but Suhab said, but we start from the interest of the parties involved. And then because Ibn Taymiyyah supports our view, so we have a prestigious scholar to cite, we say that the, those three talaks are only one and there was no disagreement among us on that issue. And he goes on to give the case where this, where this came up, why they felt it's socially important to, uh, to come up with this particular, uh, particular ruling. All right, in this case, he's starting from a, a sense of what would be socially in the interest of Muslims. It's consequentialist reasoning. He talks about maslahat, and then looks for a justification, which he finds in Ibn Taymiyyah. But on other topics, the, the same scholars is, uh, find solutions in Hanafi jurisprudence. Um, for example, on the, uh, the, the, the Hanafi-based notion that uh, even without the wife's guardian, a marriage can be considered Islamically correct, and hence a civil marriage in England can, can be considered Islamically correct. Here's how Suheb justifies this. There's an, in, a, in a civil marriage, there's an ijab kabul by both parties, and even if the amount of the mahar is not set, it then automatically becomes the usual one for the economic status of the parents. This is also a Hanafi provision. The only problem that arises is that the consent of the guardians is not required at a civil marriage. The alul hadith, remember Suheb is a, he considers himself alul hadith, does require the explicit consent of the guardian. However, the Hanafi school says that if the couple elopes, the wife's guardian can invalidate the marriage only if the woman is marrying someone of lower status or the dower is too low. If he doesn't do so within a reasonable time, then the marriage is valid. Under that understanding, at a civil marriage, because the parents are there, the civil marriage is Islamically valid. We decided that we would follow the Hanafi school in this matter and recognize the civil marriage. So in this case, they follow Hanafi. In the triple talaq case, they follow Ibn Taymiyyah against Hanafi and other legal schools. And in fact, they do something that's in practice akin to what's followed uh, by the creators of the Muslim marriage contract, that is, pick and choose in order to have a, a socially desirable outcome. But publicly, as I said before, they denounce that method of, of proceedings. Um, in practice, at least, um, this, the Leighton Council, I'll, I'll conclude now, finds itself constrained to respond to local social and legal conditions. They're taking another of steps, a number of steps to um, incorporate 
uh, uh, practices of the, civil, in the, of the civil court system into Islamic law, such as the case of marriage I mentioned before. And at the same time, to maintain an international Islamic credibility by consistently stressing their reliance on reputable Islamic sources. All the more so in that many of the divorces in question are transnational and hence are going to be judged presumably elsewhere. Thus, the council finds itself working in both domestic and transnational spaces and having to develop modes of justification that can mediate between them. Divorce does indeed travel in some sense. Um, it does so in a way that looks some, somewhat extraterritorial as a bit of Pakistan dropped into London. But, on the other, but in fact, it's shaped to the possibilities afforded by English laws and institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank Professor Olivier Roy and uh, Valerie Amiro, including the people from the center, for having me here. And it's my pleasure to try to address you with a couple of uh, recent uh, thoughts about Bosnian Muslims. Uh, in, in, in a way, it will be a bit different uh, presentation that we have during this conference, having in mind that usually Bosnian Muslims are understood as autochthonous European Muslims. And then and their history and their uh, uh, so, so to say, way of uh, existence in the in European soil is rather different than some immigrants' uh, communities, let aside now, fact whether they are first, second, or third generation. So, so there is uh, some specificity, and I'll try to capture that during my, my, my presentation. Uh, therefore, my, my concept or my paper is uh, titled as Bosnian Muslims being a model or being an exception in, uh, in the European uh, uh, nation state concept. Uh, and uh, I will try to, to provide you with some, some of the thoughts. Uh, about that. However, I will start, start uh, because it is necessary with uh, Marx Eger's manner ob observations that the fading of nation state and disillusionment with all forms of secular nationalism have produced both the opportunity for new nationalisms and uh, need for them. The opportunity have arisen because the old order seems to be so weak and the need for national identity persists because no single alternative form of social cohesion and affiliation has yet appeared to dominate public life in the way nation state did in the 20th century. And why this Jürgen's matter observation is very important because uh, he continues the secular ties have begun to unreveal in post-Soviet and post-colonial era. So local leaders have searched for new anchors to ground their social identity in, and identities and political loyalties. So it is quite, quite the case with the Bosnian Muslims in, in the sense that transitional, transitional context from post-socialist uh, era of, of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and former Yugoslav state is uh, really marked with one specific nexus, and that nexus was of religion and, and politics. So unlike in other countries of Eastern and Central Europe, re religion and religiosity acquired attributes as outstanding political factors in the countries, while at the same time politics is being reshaped as an exceptional religious fact. By treating religion as an important source of political legitimacy, as well as by acting as a national political first class instances of legitimization, all three religious communities, including the Islamic community, uh, provided and has been providing the respective nationalistic strategies with additional legitimacy. And that legitimacy has been very particular one since there has, that has been legitimacy of national nature from above, the legitimacy of sanctified nature. In the way, so new political elites or dominant nationalistic strategies acted under the of the secret, secret canopy. So that's, in, for, for former Yugoslavia, is not a kind of a surprise having in mind that uh, religion happened to be the only source of counterculture in the communist era. And uh, it's really affect uh, every, social, every social strata. And we need to have in mind that since that time, uh, there has been no other agency of comparable size undertaking the role of preserving and transmitting national cultures and basic values. So Bosnian Muslims, uh, into that uh, respect, is, is really the, the very uh, similar to, to what has happened the Catholic Church, for example, in, in Croatia or Orthodox Church in Serbia, into that respect, however, with some uh, specificities, and therefore I would need to, to, to briefly go through some very crucial historical points in developments of Bosnian Muslims in order to bring it in my concluding remarks, what is going on, what is going on uh, now. Uh, of course, uh, Bosnia happened to be the part of, integral part of Ottoman Empire uh, till middle 15th century and for five next following centuries, Bosnia is integral part, so there were no differences. Uh, uh, the relatively a millet system was applied to Bosnia like in any other parts of the system, uh, of, of the part of the empire. Uh, however, uh, which is quite impo important to notice is basically early 19th century when Austrian-Hungarian rule is coming in Bosnia and Herzegovina and 
that period we are usually addressing as a kind of a crossing for Oriental Islamic to European Western culture. And Bosnia and Herzegovina was very much under this uh, paradigm in, in, and into that respect, uh, uh, what's happened is both demographic and social changes. According to some uh, of uh, relevant uh, historical and uh, research data, about 150,000 Muslims left Bosnia at the time when, when the, when the uh, new rulers arrived due to asking a very simple question. Should Muslims live under the non-Muslim ruler? That was, that was the basic, uh, basic the question, or make a hijra or not. So Andrew was uh, yesterday in panel mentioning the famous, uh, uh, famous uh, fatwa of uh, Rashid Rida, hijra wa hukum muslim in Bosnia Fiha, and uh, it was uh, kind of the uh, explanations why Muslims should stay in Bosnia. And uh, it was uh, made because some of the Bosnian scholars asked for that. However, 20 years before Rashid Rida, uh, one Bosnian mufti, namely mufti Mehmet Teofik Azapagic, so 20 years before Rashid Rida, also do the very same. He was issuing the fatwa explaining why Bosnian Muslims should stay in the homeland, because it was the issue of their country of origin. It was not uh, the, some kind of the different, but they should stay there and preserve their, their norms. So uh, the question uh, why this was all important was uh, uh, actually the whole new concept of uh, Sharia and Sharia applications in the Bosnian, in Bosnian society for, for the Bosnian, uh, Bosnian Muslims. Uh, uh, in that uh, very particular moment with Austrian Hungary rule, uh, Sharia provisions had been limited solely to the matters of family relations, issues related to inheritance, and to the administration of Vakovs, uh, yeah, religious endowments. Uh, and uh, uh, already at that time, uh, the new concept uh, or have been introduced, as well as a new term, the one of the personal status. And until then period, it was completely unknown to Sharia practice in Bosnia, in Bosnia Herzegovina, or otherwise. However, Muslims remain determined to make a new rule more receptive towards a number of issues relevant to Islamic religious uh, life and reg regulations. And in 909, they drafted the very important documents called Statute for Autonomous Rule of Islamic Religious Vakufs and Educational Affairs in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which eventually have been accepted. So by that period, already Islamic community become, in a way, autonomous out of secular or out of uh, foreign non-Muslim ruler for matters of uh, uh, vakufs about religious education and about issues of rule of uh, Islamic community, community management. Nothing much changed in the period of kingdom of Serb, Croats, and Slovenes, and Yugoslavia, but 1946 and the uh, end of Second World War will be very important, again, having in mind that communists abolished Sharia courts and Sharia rules. So from 1996, Sharia is not anymore implemented into Bosnian context. Uh, uh, but in this entire period, from Austrian Hungary period ruler until uh, the recent time we all the times have the kind of uh a bargaining between two groups of Islamic uh, scholars and ulemas, namely those called reformist and those called uh, traditionalist, or modernist and versus traditionalist. And issues were mostly about the, the issues about uh, reconstructing administration of vakufs, changes in Sharia provisions regarding financial matters, but later it will become very important also to see some uh, wider aspects of the public life, like dress code of women's uh, issues of uh, education in the local language, uh, uh, meaning uh, mother tongue and all these things. Things. And eventually, modernists uh, were the ones who, who really uh, succeeded much, much uh, better than traditional ulama at the time has been uh, doing. In the communist period, uh, religion was uh, naturally uh, at at least in the first part of that, in the first two decades, understood in, in very, very problematic terms, in terms that uh, communists understood religion as be very awkward, as something that is uh, very uh, completely negatively perceived, traditionalistic, anachronistic, retrograde, and so on and so forth. And basically, we are talking about forced atheization of entire society, including, including the Muslims. Uh, and uh, with certain, uh, of course, aspects I need to have in mind that Yugoslav forced atheization was not kind of the pure Soviet type of atheization. So so there was a possibility to practicing religion and uh, to, to, to run uh, the, the, the different uh, religious institutions. And to, to surprise of some, during the former Yugoslavia, meaning Tito Yugoslavia, there have been more mosques built in Bosnia and Herzegovina than during the Ottoman Empire. Of course, mosques have been not built by uh, communist or state money, but uh, believers were building the mosques by their endowments. But still, th there was a flourishing of different, uh, different uh, activities going on. Uh, however, uh, which is important to, to 
realize here is unfortunately or fortunately to some, two different cultures have been formed, mutually quite distant, one being systematic and atheistic, which did not use institutional means just to support itself, but often to impose itself. And so it's resulted in this hegemony in culture, being out, and the different one being outside of the system, but legal, which is officially embedded in, into the private sphere with no significant public and social events. Also, the, the, the middle of uh, uh, late 60s, beginning of 70s was quite important also in terms of the Islam and Muslims in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Namely, at that time, communists uh, recognized a Muslim ethnic group as a so-called Yugoslav people. But the catch here was that the name or uh, designation was Muslim with a capital M. What does it mean? It, it basically means that uh, in Bosnian language, Serbian or Croatian, Muslim or Musliman with a capital M is a basically <coughs> members of ethnic group, which is in a way kind of a secular notion. Why Muslim written with a smaller, Musliman with a, a smaller case, is a, a practicing, practicing believer of, inter, inter, uh, of uh, Islamic community. So paradoxically, at that time, uh, like Hussein Effendi Jozo, one of the great uh, scholars of Bosnian Muslims, noticed we have a paradox. We have a Muslim who are not a Muslim. So it has been possible during the communist period of regime because of all these things. In 1993, in the middle of the war, however, Bosnia Assembly in Sarajevo decided the terms uh, Muslim with a capital M is not more, it's no longer in the use. So today we have the Bosniaks as a national name and the term Muslim is used solely in the domination of confessional designation. Um, I would briefly, because of the time, go through, through, through some of the other important elements, maybe discussions to come to them and, and go directly to, to recent developments. But these two uh, elements, uh, legacy of Western Hungary period, and uh, fights of uh, modernist versus conservative ulema, as well as the Yugoslav settings of, of, of forced uh, atheization, which was kind of the way masked uh, authentic secularization, one could say, it is now quite interesting how is religion coming back uh, in, in the public sphere in 1990s and after 1990s. Uh, I will also use uh, here opportunity to present you with some of the uh, data that I collected from my own research, having in mind that uh, uh, so far I did not have a chance to see anyone uh, ask Muslims of Bosnia and Herzegovina what they really think about many different things. So, so I do the research, and it was rather very extensive, extensive research with a number of data. There was a 600 uh, 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 sample was of out of six, 600 uh, people, really uh, through the representative course. And for this conference, I think it will be quite interesting to see that majority of the Muslims of Bosnia and Herzegovina, or vast majority, more than 85%, have the very, very strong affiliation to Islamic community, the way of organizations. So the matters in, 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 in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the uh, majority of them, again, about 90%, which is quite interesting, said that they have been raised in religious manner inside the family. So what does it mean? Uh, it is basically mean that majority of these people were also raised during the period of communism, which is quite interesting. Uh, and however, only 36% of them uh, consider themselves more religious than their parents. So, so they're, they're not really considering to being more religious, having in mind that now religion is, uh, so to say, uh, free to practice without any problems. Or on the contrary, so now it's even socially desirable to practice religion in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, but uh, uh, further on, I would say that this is uh, also important to see how things are going on when it's come to, to, to issue the community. Bosnian Muslims have kind of the average trust in Islamic community, so it's very much depend on, on the issues to the issues. When it's come to the issues of public morality or when it's come to the issue to education, they would like to see Islamic community doing more in terms of private life and in terms of privacy. But when it's come to issues of the social affairs or problematics in terms of uh, 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 economic status of Bosnian Muslims and so on, they, they said that they are not quite uh, happy with a uh, with, uh, Bosnian clergy, and which is quite important, big, big majority do not uh, look uh, on the religious community as uh, their role to be strengthened in the field of politics and the field of media. So we could say that the majority of my respondents would like really see clear secular politics uh, to be uh, let aside of influence of religious, religious communities. Uh, uh, I have been asking also some interesting questions, let aside Ibadat and a number of the issues uh, that was considered that. I was asking about some of the uh, normative and interpretative characters of some norms. So for example, I asked uh, my respondents, should uh, Muslims uh, observe Islamic norms concerning food and drink? 
That was one of the basic questions. 52.3% said definitely agree with the statement that Muslims should observe Islamic norms considering the food and drink, uh, while 31% uh, agree to a certain extent. So only 2% disagree with uh, these, these facts. And, and so it's quite clear that when it's come to the halal and the issues of doctrinal nature, it seems to be that there is no, of course, any big questions about that. However, I also asked about uh, issues of uh, rather interpretative origin. For example, should women be dressed according to the Islamic norms? And there, here, for, to surprise to somebody, majority thinks that should, there should not be harsh uh, elements in terms of dressing of the woman. So majority of my respondents, almost 60% of them, think that they should not necessarily obey to this interpretative tradition. What does it mean, Islamic dress code, in particular when it's come to the woman? Finally, I also asked the question in terms of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, multi-religious context, having in mind that there are Christians, uh, both Catholic and Orthodox, uh, and during the more more or less in therapy, should, uh, Muslim, should the food forbidden to Muslims should be uh, offered in the market? And almost 90% of my respondents have no problem at all to have this kind of uh, market that will register without any problem that these things that should be forbidden to Muslims can be offered in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So it, it's really uh, become uh, quite interesting that this is just, of course, some, some of the snapshots. Uh, but I would say that um, if there is a possible comparison, I would say that Bosnian Muslims are kind of the average of the European uh, similar similar research when it's come to the religious, the importance of religion in the daily life, and so on. But the uh, role of clergy or organized religion in Bosnia and Herzegovina is not necessarily always in the line with its members' uh, yeah, you know, with its members, uh, understanding. So, so often uh, Bosnian clergy, uh, in particular the top-ranking officials, uh, are getting into the field requesting some redefinition of the public space, redefinition of state and faith relations, and so on and so forth. Uh, French scholar Xavier Bougarel in his analysis of Islam in Bosnia and Herzegovina basically identified three different types of Islam in Bosnia we could uh, consider it as, as important. Islam defined as individual faith, Islam as a common culture, and Islam as discriminatory political ideology. Uh, I would say that first two categories, Islam as individual faith and Islam as a cultural uh, matter, is much, much more present than this uh, discriminatory political ideology, which is still getting a kind of, a kind of uh, there through different Wahhabi and Salafi movements sponsored by Saudi Arabia and some other governments. But in order to explain why Islam as a private faith and Islam as a culture is more present in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I will use just two basic examples, and that will be my concluding remarks. First example is um, that uh, uh, Reis ul Ulema, or Grand Mufti of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it's also kind of the interesting, Reis ul Ulema is a title that has only remained with the Bosnian Muslims. Not other Muslims in the world use Reis ul Ulema title. And because of the clarity, I will keep talking as a Grand Mufti of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is common English translation. Grand Mufti, having been asked about uh, Yusuf al-Karadavi fatwa, issued about uh, ritual slaughter of the animals. And the point here is that some Bosnians were asking uh, Yusuf al-Karadavi to talk about whether it's uh, uh, okay to order uh, the meat from uh, Australia and some overseas countries uh, for, for a Bayram and, and for this. Uh, Yusuf Karadavi gave the positive opinion about that. However, Grand Mufti of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Mustafa Efendi Atseric, uh, answered, I'm quoting, as long as there is a fatwa council of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and there is official part of Islamic community structure in Bosnia and Herzegovina. No one but that institution can issue valid fatwas for Muslims in Bosnia and Herzegovina. According to Tseric, Grand Mufti of Bosnia and Herzegovina, it is also due to Kias, huh? analogy, and since there is no more caliphas, the expert territorial jurisprudence should be applied. So he was quite clear about that, and, uh, and I think that the majority of the Bosnian Muslims get the message. Although it's quite controversial and could be discussed in many different ways, I'm not the scholar really expert in these issues. I just know that as a sociologist, that it's pay quite a lot of attention why, why this was used in a way. Uh, so in some other cases, religious uh, leaders in Bosnia and Herzegovina, including Mustafa Tseric, took position that proper interpretation and application of Sharia norms to contemporary situations cannot be based solely on the textual studies without having at the same time adequate knowledge about social reality and also accept the social social reality. So it's mostly going when it's uh, the things uh, Bosnian Muslims are mostly concerned is nikah, marital relations, and miraz, including the issues of the inheritance and so on and so forth. The second example I will use, uh, as promised, is a reasoning and writing one of the most influential Bosnian Islamic scholars, Professor Fikret Karcic from Faculty of Islamic Community, who said, I'm quoting, the dilemma is not either Sharia or secular state. It is possible to have Sharia in the secular state if we understand Sharia as Islamic normative system that includes religious, ethical, and legal norms. 
In a secular state, only religious and ethical norms will be relevant, while legal norms will transform themselves into the ethical ones. And secondly, understood secular state as neutrality with respect, whereby religious norms are not the state laws and neither state laws become religious." Uh, end quote. So these two paradigmatical examples, I think, is uh, really helping to understand why it is shaping in, in a different way and why this discriminatory Islamic uh, uh, ideology really does not have a soil ground for, for, for most Muslims. However, I need to end uh, with one very interesting uh, developments going on recently, and some of you might be aware of the documents called Declaration of European Islam. It was made by Grand Mufti of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Reis Ululema, who was tried to offer at kind of the documents, really entitled Declarations of European Muslims, envisioned to be a blueprint for institutionalization of Islam in Europe. So declarations contains, according to Mufti Tseric, a rather clear message that European Muslims are fully and unequally committed to the rule of law, to the principles of tolerance, to the values of democracy and human rights. For him, I'm quoting, Europe is neither Darul Islam, a house of peace, nor Darul Harb, a house of war. For Grand Mufti Tseric, Europe is Darul Sulh, a house of social contract. Europe is not Darul Islam because Muslims do not constitute the majority, and uh, it's neither Darul Harb because some aspects of Muslim law can be implemented. But the land of Europe is Darul Sulh because it's possible to live in accordance with Islam in the context of social contract, end quote. Uh, I wouldn't like to be too much in favor of Mustafa Tseric because I'm actually not, and I will explain now for concluding Jamar why I'm not. Because this, what I quoted, is most probably the most important elements concerning the religion. However, all other arguments are rather of the political, ideological context, and therefore, uh, not so many people in, in Europe, in European context, in the Muslim context, do not take these declarations as important document. It is due, mostly due to, to the fact that this is a clearly advocating of um, European uh, model of European minorities in terms of the new European Union, which is, of course, quite contrary to the to the issue of uh, to the issue of uh, being a citizens in new European Union despite the, the differences in religion, ethnic, ethnicity, and so on, and so forth. So uh, really, as a conclusion, just final quote is again why this uh, uh, Bosnian Muslim uh, case should be further on researched and used as illustration. Because we are clearly here have Ahl Sunnah branch of Islam, including the Maturidi to ch teaching in Akkad and Hanafi Meshab, or right in a fiqh, that's, that's kind of the very very important element while speaking of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, one should also have in mind that Bosnian Muslims have a, a rather long tradition of Sufi orders and Sufi tariqats, opinions in all of these uh, matters. Then a heritage of Ottoman uh, Islamic cultural zone is here present in rather different way than in some other Eastern, Eastern uh, countries. We have a tradition of Islamic reformism or Islah in understanding of the Islam and for us, conference, I think very important, institutionalization of Islam through Islamic community and practice of living Islam within the secular state for many, many years. So I hope that further research and some other comments might be inspirational to understanding the future place of Islam in Europe to come. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, 30 minutes? 30 minutes? 20. Okay. Uh, okay, right. Um, thank you very much for, for the invitation to be here. Um, my paper had a, had a title. It was um, Minority Islam Between the Global Islamic Revival and the Problematics of, the Europe, of European Integration, uh, a case study of the European Council for Fatwa and Research. So as the, subtitle, as the subtitle suggests, uh, my paper is really an attempt to understand this institution, the European Council for Fatwa and Research, which is an institution committed to the integration of Muslims in Europe through the production and dissemination of contextualized religious advice or fatwas. Although, as we will see, the particular understandings of integration that these muftis propose are contested by Muslims and by non-Muslims in Europe and beyond. Uh, and I hope that my presentation will speak to some of the other talks. I'm thinking Andrew March already did. Um, quite some work in laying the ground um, for this. I will, I, I will not deal with the substantive issues and in how the opinions or the fatwas relate to law. What I will try to do is put forward an, an interpretation of the kind of project that the ECFR articulates. And the task, I think, is to provide an account that both foregrounds Muslim traditions of reason, the Muslim traditions of reasoning, which are central to the practice of ifta, of fatwa giving, 
without falling into a culturalist interpretive framework. So very briefly, the European Council for Fatwa and Research was founded in London in March 1997 at the initiative of the Federation of Islamic Organizations in Europe, which is basically the confederation of European Muslim organizations associated with the ethos of the Muslim Brotherhood. And by establishing the fatwa body, the federation aimed at securing the emerging reflection on what is now routine, routinely called a Muslim jurisprudence for minorities, Muslim fiqh al um, As Andrew March mentioned yesterday, it's a new topic of jurisprudence. There's been a, pr a rapid proliferation of writings on the topic. Um, some of the most famous advocates live here in America, uh, also in France, Egypt, and the Gulf. And, and they cross lines between state Islam and oppositional Islam. Um, I think the texts are quite interesting. Uh, they are interventions into the debates about the Muslim presence in the West, which also connect with wider debates on the reform uh, of Islam, the dynamic, the, the viability of, 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 of Islamic tradition, and the dynamics of religious authority. Um, it is not always clear, however, uh, what is at stake in this construct, not least because the, the actors who are writing on this uh, have very, very different backgrounds. And, uh, uh, are located quite differently also across the religious spectrum um, and address different audiences. So I think uh, perhaps a minimalist definition of what fiqh al is will, will, would stress a commitment to the Islamic legal tradition, to fiqh, uh, and, and a certain perception of the problem of, or a certain perception of the status of minority as constituting a particular problem to this legal tradition. Uh, having said this, on, on a close reading, it is clear that the understandings or the kinds of commitment to fiqh vary significantly as do the understandings of what the, minor the minority status entails and whether minority is actually a, a, an appropriate term at all to refer to Muslims who live in Western liberal societies. Uh, so perhaps the success of this term and the way it it has been appropriated, lies in its plasticity. In a sense, uh, uh, minority fiqh is liable to different kinds of appropriations, and Muslim actors, in particular contexts, are able to draw on it and also intervene constructively um, uh, and perhaps reshape the terms of integration debates in Europe. Um, I think it is also significant that perhaps the first term the, the first time the term fiqh al was mentioned by the likes of uh, Yusuf al-Qaradawi was when justifying the existence of this European Council for Fatwa and Research uh, in, in, in terms that suggest that the, the, this council would not be competing with other established fiqh councils, but rather uh, would be a specialized body uh, aiming at um, contributing to a reflection on minority fiqh. Um, yeah, so I think a, an analysis of minority fiqh must also include a study of the practical orientations or the fatwas which are issued in its name and that render these theoretical constructs rather concrete. Um, now, I assume here that fatwas are discourses that contribute to shaping Muslim selves in particular ways and that therefore they cannot be simply opposed to practices. And one question that I ask is, what are the conceptions of discourse and of discourse's effects that are upheld by the, by, by the relevant actors? Um, and I think the fatwas issued by, specifically by the ECFR purport to, and I quote, meet the needs of Muslims in Europe, solve their problems, and regulate their interaction with European society. So the question becomes, where does such regulatory power come from? And how do, the, how do these muftis seek to inscribe this power upon European Muslims? Um, an answer to that would stress uh, that the authority of the fatwas is secured through an engagement with the authority of Islamic texts, Quran and Sunnah, most of all. Also through the, dis the disclosure of the reasoning that underlies the opinion. Uh, and the inscription of the specific issue in a broader narrative structure, as well as through the invocation of a set of moral principles and juridical formulas known as qawaid al fiqhiyya which help to construct Islam and Europe in specific ways. And I think two of these formulas, which are repeated, repeatedly cited and invoked, are central to the project of the ECFR. A taisir, lenience or facility, and al waqa the reality.
Uh, they, they constitute not only the basis of the integration process attempted by the Fatwa Council, but also lie at the hearts, I would argue, lie at the heart of the politics of authenticity, which is enacted by the ECFR in print. Um, now, although facility and reality are invoked by the members of the Fatwa Council as if they constituted rather unproblematic concepts, the incorporation of the notions have been, has not been devoid of ambiguities. And I think when one reads the fatwas of the ECFR, one is stricken by the underlying tension uh, between, on the one hand, the attempt to reconcile Isla Islamic norms or, or norms deemed Islamic with the practices of the mainstream host societies and a reiteration of the Islamic tradition's contemporary relevance on the other. So the texts which are negotiated collectively within the council oscillate between the emphasis on the relatively powerlessness of Muslims and the stress upon their individual responsibility. So the former, the powerlessness of Muslims, founds a regime of exceptions which minimize or suspend traditional Islamic norms through concepts such as darur and necessity or emphasis on the limits of the law, while the latter purposefully ignore the context or at least minimize its importance in order to appeal to a more universal sense of individual moral, moral responsibility. And I think this tension can be traced in part to the membership of the ECFR itself. While most of the members are Europe-based, and some have been directly involved in the national processes of state institutionalization of Islam, the Middle Eastern leadership provided by Yusuf al-Qardawi and Faisal Maulawi, which are respectively the ECFR's chairman and vice chairman, um, give the council a distinctively diasporic flavor. So although they carry, and I quote, the worries and anxieties of their fellow Muslims in Europe, visit them on a regular basis and appreciate their condition. These charismatic scholars based in the, in the Middle East work within a discursive field primarily shaped by conditions in the Muslim world, and in particular by the problematics of the Islamic revival. By contrast, the muftis based in Europe, and particularly those which are affiliated with the Federation of Islamic Organizations in Europe, have been preoccupied with national and increasingly European discourses about the integration of Muslims and the fear of Islamic radicalization. These scholars and their organizations have been typically engaged in the promotion of Islam as an accommodating civil religion. So integration on the one hand and the Islamic revival provide two rationalities or two conceptual arenas and a field of tension which are crucial for situating the work of the CCFR. So what I'll try to do here, uh, and I think I have still some time, is, is, is to propose that we should understand what the CCFR does um, through its factors as as, 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 as a mode of interpolation, uh, interpolating European Muslim subjects through the creation of a particular pl public. And I'm drawing here mostly on Michael Warner's articulation of the concept of the public to argue that the ECFR's construction of a minority fiqh should be seen as the result of this conjunction between the, a particular tension that I just sketched above briefly between you know, the cultivation of a pious subjectivity in tune with the temporalities of the global Islamic revival and the perceived necessity to integrate Muslims into a more local context. So this tension in conjunction with a specific relation to public discourse. Uh, and I think what, what that allows us to see, perhaps, is that um, um, the media wars, which are the, the fatwa wars, which are recurrently played in the media, um, um, and which, which have led Muslim scholars to try and pre precisely to institutionalize fatwa bodies and what Khaled Masoud was saying yesterday to join between ishtihad and ijma through collective fatwa bodies in an attempt to reestablish an always elusive consensus has perhaps less to do with the divisions amongst the ulama, real though they are, I'm not trying to deny this, or even um, their varying hermeneutical strategies, and, but has perhaps more to do with the properties of public discourse and the open-ended nature of discourse's circulation within publics. Uh, so to go back to Warner, I think one could say that the members of TCFR, they may see themselves as addressing a European Muslim community and guiding it further into the path of the Islamic revival, but perhaps it's more useful to see them as creating a distinctive public or counter-public, I'll go back to that, of European Muslims instead or 
despite or rather because of internal differentiations in terms of language, ethnicity, class, political orientation, and levels of religious commitment. So a public, as Michael Warner has pointed out, is an imagined relationship among strangers characterized by the reflexive circulation of discourse. It requires mere attention, and its rhetorical imagination is a performative act. In other words, it creates a public merely by virtue of addressing it as such. Right. So the ECFR's use of fatwas, then, um, is a way of addressing indefinite strangers, as well as real petitioners. Um, and it interpolates Muslim subjects in Europe in certain ways. Um, so there is a sense of practical possibility, which is derived from the actual distribution of petitioners, so from the fact that people ask questions to the ECFR and send them more questions that they, that they can actually answer, and therefore that naturalize the disciplinary project of the ECFR, but at the same time the larger audience of indefinite readers um, underpins um, the hope of transformation, which according to Warren is constitutive of any public. So this is, a, of course, a distinctive modern form of power which partakes in, pro in processes of subject formation. And it relies on a variety of media forms. So the statements of TCFR are issued mostly from Dublin, then they are relayed by Islam Online, Al Urubiya, which used to be a monthly publication of the Federation um, from France, but also they are discussed in publications such as Ashark al Ausat or through live satellite TV shows in Al Jazeera, Al Sharia wal Hayat in particular, um, and then eventually collected into publications in, in two Egyptian presses. Um, so it appears as a distinctly transnational space. Um, and I think it's, it also goes beyond, to some extent, um, uh, the global space that characterized Muslim fiqh throughout the ages, not least in its acknowledgment of the limits of fiqh discourse, um, but also in its willingness to open up the circulation of discourse to further elaboration, even contestation from voices uh, beyond uh, those of the ulama. So there's been, um, Olivier Roy is not here. Oh, he's there, okay. Uh, he's, been, he, he's been one of the participants at the sessions of TCFR, uh, who's been uh, quite open to social scientists also, and has been, in, to, I think, to some extent, um, engaging in productive ways with social scientific discourse uh, on Islam in Europe. Now, um, I'm not sure how much time I have. Um, five minutes, right. So th there's something, I mean, um, I, I think I skipped this. Uh, I, I, I try, of course, to, mo most of you will probably be familiar with the work of Charles Hirschkin. I think his compelling study of uh, the Islamic revival in Egypt has been an inspiration, so I try to engage him and a little bit, uh, en engage a little bit with the, the ethical listener that he, pro he proposes as the par paradigmatic figure of the, uh, of the counterpublics in Egypt, of the Islamic counterpublic in Egypt, by suggesting that in this case, perhaps the figure of the Muslim reader, which is suggested by uh, one of the editors of the Fatwa collections of the ECFR uh, is perhaps m more appropriate. I don't, I don't really have time to discuss that. Uh, but I would like to ask then, if one sees the ECFR as instituting a kind of public, how does one measure the success of this public? Uh, bearing in mind that uh, uh, to say simply uh, that there's a gap between the audience uh, uh, the actual audience and the intended audience is not enough, in the sense that a public defined by Warren is precisely always in excess. Uh, it's a mode of address always in excess of its actually social base. So, uh, w what criteria should we mobilize uh, to measure this Islamic counterpart? I think, I think perhaps, um, given the features of the public that are mostly alluded to, and in particular what Warner calls its autotelic character. In other words, it, it, the public is a self-organized space where no single agency mo mo can monopolize this course. I think perhaps there are limited ways in which this kind of public can be disrupted. I will suggest three. Um, uh, if, I have, if, if, as I have been suggesting, the public imagined by DCFR is characterized by a tension between the impetus of the Islamic revival and the problematics of integration in Europe, then arguably the public will not be significantly disrupted by discourses which place different emphasis 
on the former or the latter. Rather, the public will only be disrupted by discursive interventions which deny outright the relevance of a public Islamic religiosity, as in the discourse of secular Muslims, for example, or which denies the relevance of the necessity to integrate, as in the discourse of, of certain so-called Muslim organizations. So intermediate critiques, even violent ones, certainly pose challenges to the religious authority of TCFR, uh, but but I think do not do, do not do not really disrupt it. And 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 one example is the fact that people like Tariq Ramadan, for, who have been uh, among the most vocally critics of the ECFR, can be invited uh, to attend the sessions or, or and even join the council, whereas others, such as Izbu Tahrir or, or Salafi scholars, saying that Muslims should actually simply immigrate from Europe, uh, are much more difficult to incorporate into the reflection. Now, a, sec a, second a second possible disruption is, I think, an attempt to, is, is through any attempt to shift uh, the idiom and thus the competences required for public speaking. Uh, I'm thinking perhaps of uh, here of Tariq Ramadan's shift from um, what he calls the spirit of the fatwa to its psychology in his critique of TCFR. So Tariq Ramadan issued, uh, uh, introduced the French, the French translation of TCFR's fatwas uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a quietly critical way by saying, the spirit of the fatwa is very interesting. These people are willing to perform ishtihad, come up with new solutions, pragmatic solutions. However, fatwa also has a psychology, and this psychology requires living amongst European, living in Europe and and being immersed in the context. And this is something that the Muftis were either living in the East or at least had been trained and lived long periods of their life in the East are not able to achieve. Now, a, thir a third way in which the public may be disrupted is if it is misrecognized. And I use misrecognition in a particular way, which is to say, if the fiction of the public self-organization is exposed as ideological, and an, ins an instance of this misrecognition or unmasking occurs when European Muslims do not recognize themselves as legitimate addressees. Uh, for example, by raising doubts about the legitimacy of the European Council for Fatima Research, um, or by implying that the public in question is in fact the manifestation of some other unavowed political project. Uh, I'm thinking here when a group of believers outside a Dublin mosque circulate leaflets that suggests that the fatwas of the ECFR actually are carrying the misguided political project of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, perhaps a different expression of a similar misrecognition may be found in the indifference of the intended audience. Uh, so if a public requires mere attention, as Warner says, attitudes of neglect uh, may be seen as compromising it to some extent. So I'll conclude briefly. Um, there'll be other things to say perhaps, uh, but to say that what I've been trying to describe here is uh, how the ECFR is, is an, a discursive attempt to cultivate a certain kind of European Muslim subject. Uh, now, the, the question that I have not really dealt with is how can one describe the fields of power within and through which such constructions are deployed in Europe? And, and for example, what, what relation does the counterpublic imagined by the ECFR stand to projects articulated in the mainstream European public spheres? And how do state policies and discourses articulated in the media authorize or undermine the dynamics of the Islamic counterpublic? I think I cannot answer these questions here. I'll just say that perhaps in answering these questions, it is less useful to frame Europe as a liberal or a secular regime and then measure the extent to which the discourses articulated by the ECFR conform or do not conform with secular liberal expectations. And it is perhaps more productive to focus on specific moments and particular political rationalities that impact on policy formations and public debates. And there's, of course, a whole body of literature that can, um, that can help us there. Uh, so uh, one example, insofar as the state in France and Britain, for example, have sought to politicize religion in particular ways after 9-11 and to encourage the formation of what has been called a civil Islam, they have perhaps contributed to authorizing the public Islamic religiosity articulated by the ECFR. 
Um, and I think there are other ironic convergences between the ECFR, which is a very orthodox body, uh, and whose members are, have increasingly difficult access to European uh, territories. I mean, Cardao is banned from the US, and he's been banned from the UK effectively since 2004. Um, um, and other members are, have also difficulties getting visas. So, but there are other ironic convergences, I think. So, for example, insofar as the public imagined by the ECFR reinforces a tendency to view the post-colonial immigrant Muslim through the lenses of a racialized religious paradigm, um, it minimizes the history and power relations, including class and race, that shape the social con conditions of existence of its rhetorical addressees. Uh, on the other hand, I think we could say that integration debates, which a, a bit like the tolerance talk analyzed by Wendy Brown in her book, Regulation Aversion, seem to function by, by making demands in the extra-legal field. Insofar, insofar as, as the integration demands work in the extra-legal field, then they, the, project, the, the, the attempted process of integration uh, of TCFR, which is understood mainly in legal terms, not in cultural terms, then falls well short of the expectations um, of policymakers. So I think I'll conclude here and hopefully have some time for discussion. Thank you. So we have time for questions and answers, uh, but maybe I'll begin by, uh, in, in the three presentations seems to be a very, very strong current of looking at the transnational nature of uh, the Muslim experience, whether in Europe, and then we didn't deal with the US as much. Uh, so how are the actors are dealing with this? And then how also the official agencies, if there is a, at least here in Qardawi, is pre prevented from uh, coming to some of the state, and then raises the issue in terms of what type of minority fiqh we have in European context, if it's actually being constructed by a majoritarian Fuqaha who are coming from majority Muslim states. So can we really say that this is a minority fiqh while it is being constructed by majority Fuqaha? I think by the time we'll just answer in this, we'll call on people to have questions. Well, um, right, Kardawi. So uh, there is a program in, in back in, I think in the, in, in the early 2000s, in Al, Al Jazeera, Sharia Wal Hayat, on the ECFR, on the European, on the European Council for Fatwa and Research. Uh, and and the, the host was Mahar Abdallah, and he invited Sheikh Yusuf Al Qaradawi to comment on the ECFR. At the same time, he, he told his audience, told the audience, that uh, Al Jazeera were running uh, an online uh, uh, survey which asked the following question uh, Can scholars from the East really understand? The questions of Muslims in the West. Qaradawi was a bit upset. Uh, in, in a way, in a way, his, telev his, his favorite telev television satellite channel was staging or undermining the claims to religious authority of Sheikh Yusuf Al Qaradawi. He, of course, never lived in, never lived in the West and does not even speak a Western language. So Qaradawi had to uh, interrupt him and say that there's a um, uh, that, of course, not all Eastern scholars could answer these questions, but only some. <laughs> and he left it at that. I think um, I, I'm trying to understand a little bit what is entailed in the claim that there, Muslims in the West need a minority fiqh. And I think in part what it does is that it allows certain actors variously located in the religious field to make a claim for authority and to disqualify their opponents. Right? Uh, the construct itself, I think, is quite flexible, as I was saying. And there have been huge debates, even within institutions such as the CFR, on what, what, what it really means to construct a minority fiqh. And um, uh, uh, there's a kind of irony that the, the advocates of minority fiqh operate in, in, um, in a global setting uh, and attempt to construct symbolic boundaries. So. They, uh, um, I think it's also quite at odds with the transnational dynamic. So uh, I, th that's all I have to say. I, I want to uh, commend Alex on an outstanding presentation. I uh, think that your dissertation is going to be a major, major contribution to this field, and I can't wait to see it in print. Uh, I want to follow up a little bit on Hatim's question. 
Uh, you're painting a very interesting picture, so I want to follow up on the question of the politics of the uh, external scholars versus the internal scholars. Uh, so now you, you, you referred to two different, at least two different kinds of rejection of both the political stance of the ECFR and also this idea of both a fiqh and a fiqh of minorities. So one, this rejection from the right, the Salafi or other kinds of, uh, you know, let's say less domesticated Islamist wing, which is still in its own mind committed to some sort of an Islamic legal framework that fiqh and law is still the framework for addressing questions. Then you have, for lack of a better term, certain kinds of opposition on, to the left of the CFR, you know, obviously, uh, mutatis mutandis, uh, Ramadan, maybe a brew that we heard yesterday and so forth. Now, part of the, part of the dimension of this is these are local, uh, you know, domestic people that are born, certainly raised in Europe, and part of the challenge is uh, can people from outside answer dilemmas from people inside? So that was one dimension of the question. But then the question is, can these answers, can these questions be answered, whoever is answering them within a fiqh framework? So is it the case that fiqh al qaliyat or fiqh of whatever we're going to call it for Europe is sort of the wedge point between thinking about ethical life and, and particularly political ethics for European minorities and North American minorities within a juridical context. That is, either you go to the right in, in, in a more rejectionist framework, or if you're gonna uh, do something like Tariq Ramadan or Abru or these other, uh, these other figures, that you're really not doing Islamic law anymore, that you're opening up not just new sources of authority, new methodologies, new terminologies, but really new modes of thinking about Islamic normativity that are not only flexible and not only involving different kinds of concepts, but are really not fiqhi, really not juridical in any sense of the term, and that are somehow both occupying a space between fiqh and theology, but also creating a new space, creating new modes of reasoning that, uh, I don't know if it's like Mendelssohn or, or whatever, but is certainly, you know, uh, taking on forms of public uh, ethics, public religiosity that might be familiar from other contexts. So, uh, again, thank you. It's a wonderful research project. Yes, so I have uh, some clarification to ask to, to Professor Bowen. You said that uh, Muslim minority are functioning in three different types in France, in England, and US. And you say that uh, in France they are using public order, in England the specific community institution, and US contract. But uh, I think you wrote an article on the Conseil Musulman de France. In, in France, also Muslims have 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 also association, have also community and institution. So I didn't understand this uh, three uh, model. And uh, a question concerning uh, this is just a precision, if you can give about the education and training of uh, these ulama who are dealing with uh, a case that you mentioned, if, where they were trained, uh, how. how if they belonging to schools or something, if you if you have knowledge about this, and uh, another question, what, what they did once they give this paper or sentence, did, did they give uh, to uh, they, did they want to a public to a court of the state to be confirmed, certified, or what they did with this paper or uh, and uh, a question, a small question to to Dino. Uh, is the Imam, is the Mufti that you mentioned, uh, also have training in Sharia or, or is belonging to a school? Or mm. if you can give uh, one remark to Alexander, I think that uh, Muslim in Europe maybe are not ready uh, uh, to have a, a European scholar uh, to be head of this council of uh, fatwa. So I think uh, even Tariq Ramadan has not enough the symbolic capital to be the head. So they must have something which, what, what I'm telling, telling now is Orientalist, but this is what maybe uh, could be an explanation. So the, the, the uh, sufficient uh, symbolic po uh, power or, or uh, symbolic capital should be from the East. And uh, this is what uh, could uh, explain, Orientalist explanation, but it could be an explanation. and then
Is there another question? Yes. Um, actually, Isabel Qardawi was a frequent visitor to the U.S. in the 70s and the 80s to the conferences, and I think until they denied him um, admittance to the U.S., and he was regarded as probably one of the most suitable people because he tended to be more liberal. But uh, my question was more about um, the difference between the scholars in the United States and the scholars in Europe. They have, for instance, the Fiqh Council here, but it doesn't focus specifically on Fiqh al-Aqalliyat. It just deals with the regular Fiqh issues. And then a, a recent um, transformation here has been that there has been a um, handing of the leadership or the scholarship to the indigenous scholars, the Hamza Yusufs, the Dr. Omar Farooq Abdullahs, the Sherman Jacksons, who are actually endorsing um, traditional learning. But has there been anything comparative to that, the ind indigenization of scholars in Europe? And if not, why not? And then I had a question for Dino. Um, do you think that the uh, reaction kind of to outside scholarship in Bosnia is perhaps a reaction to the imposition of the Saudi Wahhabi norms after the Bosnian war? Would that have not occurred perhaps otherwise? Mm -hmm. well, can we take a question, maybe John? Okay, um, to start with England, um, I think you asked about uh, what happens after uh, an adjudication at one of the Sharia councils in terms of the paper, right? But, right. Well, um, the, the part I didn't want to talk about because of the focus of this panel was the imbrication of the civil courts and, and the, uh, the councils, but that was, that's what you asked about, so I'll, I'll respond. Um, the, uh, I, I spend time talking with the civil judges also, and the, the particular characteristic of the um, of, of the legal attitudes, really, one could say for England, is that they say, well, if those people want to go off and solve, take care of all their problems on their own, marriage, divorce, what have you, fine, that's not a problem, except for the best interest of the child and matters of uh, financial uh, awards, division of, of property. Then, we, uh, if, if a matter ever comes to us, we feel free to, to open up any even binding arbitration that's been undertaken and look at it. Now, at this point, uh, most of these, these councils act illegally as, as mediation councils. In other words, there's no legal quality, legal effect in the English legal system of what they do. There is a Muslim ar arbitration tribunal, which now does, the head of it, uh, um, Faiz Asudik, is both a, a peer in the, in the South Asian sense, not yet a peer in the English sense, uh, and a barrister. And in and, and his, uh, their councils actually, there's a solicitor and an expert in, in Islamic law we're always working together, but they actually tend to avoid uh, marriage and divorce cases. They take on cases which we might think of as secular involving Muslims, a dispute among shopkeepers and that sort of thing. So at this point, uh, there's very little in the way of a, a, a direct legal effect uh, of a determination by one of these, one of these councils, right? So it's, um, it, it's, uh, its legal effect is within a, in an Islamic legal framework, uh, but then potentially it, looking globally within say a Pakistani or a Sudanese or a Yemeni legal framework as well. And that's what we don't know much about yet, and these are fairly new institutions, but uh, that's, they're limited in that, in that way. Now, the, uh, you asked about the French case, and I simply just mentioned this at the beginning um, to, to suggest that the, if you take, I, I'm taking one particular issue, um, how a woman, a woman gets an Islamic divorce or an, uh, an annulment, and asking, uh, does, it, does the, uh, do, do, do the pathways of immigration and the legal cultures in these three countries, and uh, eventually others, lead to very different sorts of demands as well as institutions? Um, and you know, there's a, there's a huge demand in England for these services, for these goods, the uh, uh, provision of a khula or, or a fusk, which uh, doesn't exist to the same extent in France, as far as I can tell at this point. Um, and it's broader in England than in, than in the U.S., I believe. There's a whole range of, of, of demand for a whole range of Islamic services beyond the simple uh, uh, giving, uh, giving a divorce. So, so that, it, it was a really narrowly tailored sort of, sort of thing. The point about the public order in France is that I think that the, um, well, the, 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 the civil law tradition and hence the, very, uh, the lower role given to arbitration, uh, the strength in, uh, uh, the juridical strength of the notion of, notion of ordre public, and, and uh, the possibility of simply disallowing whole institutions, such as um, marriage, Islamic marriage and divorce in France, as well in other countries, um, has an effect on the demand. I think that there's actually less demand. There's more of a push from Muslim thinkers to try to come up with ways of uh, justifying civil law institutions in Islamic terms, so that a, a marriage uh, is, a, is a nikah, um, uh, and, and, and so on and, and, and so forth. Um, uh, Hence, actually, the, uh, 
well, I won't, I won't go into that. Yeah. Uh, on the, your other, some, you, your question, I believe, about passing on the torch, which I might also respond to, even though you're directed to Alex, Alexander. Um, I think this is really, really different for demographic reasons across different European countries. Uh, there's already a second generation in, I mean, a generation of, of uh, sons and daughters of, of Muslim immigrants in England who are now occupying leadership positions uh, all over. Um, and so this has already happened. They're indigenous in that sense. They're, they're born in England, I think, to a much greater extent for reasons for, of demography than in, uh, than in, than in, than in France. Um, in both cases, though, I think we would say that women occupy uh, a lesser role in those two countries than they do in the U.S., that, which is also an interesting question to pursue. I'll just be, be very brief to, 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 to our Ramadan question. I mean, if you were having in mind Grand Mufti Tseric that I was referring to, uh, he's educated uh, basically he, uh, here. He had his PhD in Chicago and uh, with Fazlur Rahman. So, so he, he was uh, also the, the head of uh, Islamic community in, 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 in Boston Islamic community in the United States for, for many years and later on. But he's theologian. He's not expert in, in, in Sharia law, if that was your question. And uh, to your question, I'm not quite sure that I get it quite right, but th there is important uh, ten tensions going on with the Wahhabi influences over the, the scholarly work because of two major reasons. Uh, with the failure of former regime, Islamic community in Bosnia has going to lose the monopoly over the two important elements. One was the literature and materials throughout, uh, the, in particular in translations and other things, and secondly in the education. Uh, prior to, 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 to 1990s, if you'd like to be get uh, educated, to be a scholar, if not in Bosnia and Herzegovina, theological schools, you would usually go through the selection through Islamic community and be sent to different schools. But now it's completely different. So uh, obviously these um, Wahhabi movements used very much opportunity to enter into the field and pluralize Bosnian Muslims, uh, but uh, I would say not to the extent that they would expect. So, so, and, uh, but finally, yes, there were some Wahhabi interpretations of Islam in Bosnia and Herzegovina. But though I would say that, uh, I mean, John and myself were recently in the conference in Chicago. It was quite interesting that one of the colleagues, Alex Alexander Kirsch, was uh, quoting uh, Kazakhs Muslims who was basically using the Bosnian Muslims as example how Muslims should not behave because they get into the U.S. Uh, treaties uh, having in mind Bosnian war and so on and so forth. So, so I would say that this tension in the future to come, we might see a bit more of that, but I, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I'm not quite worried about that. I don't know whether that's helpful. Yeah, so thank you very much for all the questions. I, um, I started with Andrews about the distinction between fiqh and ethics. Um, I, th I think the question uh, is a very good question, but it also presupposes a firm distinction between fiqh and ethics, um, if I understood you correctly. And as far as I can see, the boundaries of fiqh are not settled and have, not, have never been settled. So, I mean, on the one hand, it's true you have, a, even on the part of people like Taha Jabra Olwani, who is maybe famous, uh, in the States or, or Qaradawi, there's a certain discourse of crisis of fiqh and the need to renew it. Uh, at the same time, I think one could argue that the kind of critique of fiqh and perhaps the, the critique of legalism is also intrinsic to the fiqh tradition. And I think Khaled Masood has shown this uh, uh, very persuasively in some of his works and Ibrahim Musa also on Al-Ghazali. So there's a sense in which the boundaries between fiqh and ethics are, have, have never really been settled. And, I mean, and, and, and to suggest that ethics lie outside fiqh, it's, which is not what you're trying to suggest, uh, but to suggest that ethics lie outside fiqh would be shocking to most fuqaha, contemporary fuqaha, I think. So um, I'm not sure I answered the question, but it's this, uh, the exercise is certainly delicate. And I think that what is going on is perhaps a, a certain politicization of the fiqh tradition. And fiqh is being rendered accountable to changes in, in the underlying power relations. So I, I mean, traditional Islamic norms are being are made accountable to changes in power relations, and that can work in many different directions. So, I mean, it's a typical liberal strategy to call for you, you, human rights, for example, to say that this Islamic norm is actually takes place in a wider context. Why the context changed, so the Islamic norm should change. Therefore, women should be given equal inheritance shares. And that is happening at very different levels, although the scholars are really worried about where that can lead to, what kind of doors it may open, right? Uh, 
Mm, there's a question about the symbolic capital of Qardawi. I mean, it's certainly that Qardawi uh, was, was, was appealing for many members of the council because it's such a brand name. Um, uh, and it, uh, there's a, a minister of Qatar who once said, and Saudi Arabia has Mecca and Medina, we have Qardawi. <laughs> but he, I mean, he's certainly, he's certainly appealing and he's certainly very popular among Euro European Muslim audiences. So there's, there's a certain logic to naming him as a choice. Um, uh, I think some Muslim actors within the Federation would prefer uh, a European president. And, and certainly many European state officials would prefer to have a European at the head of the Council. Bernard Godard once told me, he's, uh, he's uh, for those who do not, he's um, uh, the advisor to, to the um, uh, religion of, uh, of the Interior Ministry, uh, who writes also on Fiqh al said, He says, you know, it's, it's good what you're doing, uh, respecting the law, calling for people to engage, promote the good, etc. But it's a pity it's Qardawi who's heading it. And I think, um, there are discussions about this, and it was interesting that even for Al Jazeera, it was problematic to have uh, an, uh, Qardawi as the member. Um, Qardawi in the US, I mean, his persona non grata, and I think increasingly in Europe also, because of a certain, uh, uh, a certain way in which his distinction between um, condemnation of terrorism and support for kamikaze operations in Palestine has become unintelligible for uh, Western policy makers after 9-11. Um, so, which does not mean that the US government does not engage Qardawi on other fronts or other Western governments. Uh, so you could find uh, some of the photos of Qardawi posted on the uh, official websites of em American embassies in the Muslim world. Um, and, and, and they still engage him formally or informally on a variety of settings. Uh, uh, John answered already partly the question about scholars grown in Europe. I think the institution I was talking about, most of the scholars are actually based in Europe, but they were educated elsewhere. There's one native German, he was a convert, Mohammed Sadiq, and then there was Mustafa Tseric, who was Bosnian, of course. Uh, at one point, there was the Albanian and the Bulgarian muftis who were part of the council, but they did not attend, and they've been removed. So I think. Uh, perhaps the, the younger generation of European Fokaha is less visible than in the States. Uh, I think for many, uh, for some of the reasons that John mentioned, many of, the, um, many of the younger generation actually, even those who are affiliated to political Islamic organizations, find the kinds of fiqh discourse that the ECFR is engaged in completely unintelligible. So there's a kind of generational clash also. Right? Why are you answering questions about whether a woman has a right to cut her hair without the permission of the husband? Why are you uh, asking questions about um, the, the right of women to divorce when the courts grant them the right to divorce, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's all. Thanks. We have another set of questions. Still a question to Alexandre. A question a bit related to uh, uh, Andrew's question, though I would say a little bit more uh, co concrete in, in a sense. Um, I was wondering if uh, uh, ECFR is, uh, have an, a kind of a tariqa aspect, uh, and what is his position about uh, the, the, the Sufi aspect of Al uh, Ikhwan al Muslimin, because uh, Hassan al Bana was and is still considered a, a wali, as far as I know, by Qardawi and, and other. Uh, and wali is a, is a specific uh, uh, Sufi uh, ranking. So um, when he launched, for instance, a, a Muslim Brotherhood, he clearly said, Nahnu uh, aqiqa Sufiya. So I wanted to know uh, what about the, this, this uh, patrimony? Uh, of Ikhwan al-Muslimin uh, inside uh, ECFR. And uh, one uh, uh, little precision, uh, I've heard from the field, but I have to check it, that Tarek Ubru was about to be involved in ECFR, but finally he wasn't because he appeared a bit too much independent in uh, 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 Qardawi's highs and probably a bit too much Sufi. So is, uh, does uh, ECFR Evacuate this aspect of uh, Ikhwan al Muslimin, or uh, what, what are the, the position about this? 
I, I answered it right. Um, uh, perhaps a brief point first. I think um, the distinction between fiqh and Sufism, or the, 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 the faqih and the Sufi, were ideal types that have a little bit fallen into disuse. I think uh, people have realized that there are numerous overlaps. Um, uh, I think this is one of the major achievements of anthropology. Um, that uh, Sufism is also a part of uh, a faqih discourse. And, and you know that well from Tariq Uru. I think it's, it's true also in the likes of Qaradawi and Bin Baye and many others. Um, oh, 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 which is not to say that there are no, no tensions uh, between, between certain forms of Sufism and certain forms of fiqh, of course. Um, Secondly, about the politics and, and, and the Sufi aspect. I mean, these are fuqaha, so their, their discourse is a discourse of fiqh. Um, um, th there, there have been many claims that the, the members of the ECFR are actually all Muslim Brotherhood. Now, the, the, and there have been tensions even within the council, but the tensions have worked in a different way. I think Qaradawi, for example, he's somebody who's uh, fiercely attached to his in independence or to what he perceives as his independence. Uh, and what is resented most is the attempt by the Federation of the Islamic Organizations in Europe, and particularly the Union des Organisations Islamiques de France, to claim the European Council for Fatwa as one of its own institutions. Uh, and he's got publicly upset about it and, uh, in 2002 when the Council was meeting in France, when Brez was, was making that claim in public. So I, I think we should, we should minimize that. I mean, in all institutions there are, of course, power relations, um, uh, and they work in various ways. Um, but, but there's a real diversity of voice, a real heterogeneity of members uh, that cannot be um, ignored. I'm not sure this is the uh, appropriate place to intervene, but uh, my question is uh, a general comment and maybe observation about this panel versus uh, other panels we've had throughout the conference. And one is, I'm, I'm, I'm actually really pleased that we're ending with uh, certain kinds of social practices because I feel like it's been left out of, of, uh, of the conference in many ways. And I wonder if some of the anxieties we've been hearing about whether it's indeterminacy uh, or flexibility or plasticity, <laughs> I wonder if these problems uh, have come to the fore because we've actually uh, focused so much on a legal framework and we've also focused uh, on understanding norms through uh, 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 restricting ourselves through un uh, understanding these things through the state. So what other kinds of frameworks might really elucidate this kind of flexibility, indeterminacy that we're talking about. And what I would suggest, and you know, it's my bias as an anthropologist really, is that we, uh, some of what is confining us in terms of pushing the boundaries on what is secular and what is religious is because we've restricted ourselves uh, with legal frameworks and we've re restricted ourselves to the state. But I, I'm saying if we actually start with mu what Muslims say and do and the practices and then relate them to certain kinds of norms, that might be more productive and instructive uh, in terms of thinking about norms. I feel like what we've actually done in some ways is normatized uh, uh, made normative Muslim uh, experiences which were, are much more diverse by the very frameworks we've used, and namely, again, legal frameworks and again, pivoting them around the state. So if we actually take Professor uh, Olivier Roy's work and think about globalized Islam vis-a-vis <laughs> -vis the state, um, I think that, that might be, uh, so it's a, it's a suggestion both in terms of, if you want to respond in terms of your panel specifically talking about certain kinds of practices vis-a-vis -vis some of the more theoretical uh, uh, frameworks. And the other point is just about, you know, and that actually pushes us to think about things like how do we understand uh, Muslim minorities who are actually global majorities? Is that the anxiety of the liberal state? You know, because you, in fact you can't place Muslim uh, Muslims within the boundaries of the nation state anymore. Uh, and so that, I think those kinds of relationships might, might be helpful in, in terms of what we're, the larger question that we might be trying to address in terms of uh, Islamic norms. Anyone? Any other questions? I think we have about 10 minutes. Maybe we could. 
Well, <coughs> you, you asked a methodological question, I think. Um, and I, we don't have to have time to think about, you know, precisely what the import is. But um, I'm just thinking of something that Alexandra and I have both written about uh, the, the Riba fatwa of, of, the, of the council and Karadawi from different perspectives. I mean, one of the, one of the great opportunities that, that uh, this sort of field uh, that we're defining over these two days opens up is, um, you know, uh, by focusing on a, a relatively narrow set of issues, uh, we, we make more explicit um, how we can collaborate across disciplines, right? So Alexandra's developed uh, uh, an, an analysis, a very fine analysis from within of the council and, 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 of, and of IFTA as an institution. That's what his emphasis has been, that this is an important and adapting Islamic institution that's part of a long history, if I understand your overall um, uh, 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 weight uh, correctly. And that's extremely valuable for someone like me then, who is, as an anthropologist, uh, more focused on um, social practices within particular institutions and all their messiness and all their, um, uh, you, you know, complicated drawing on all sorts of norms to affect a particular outcome. But these things link up. Um, so when, uh, when, when that particular fatwa was issued, uh, it then, which again, I know, I know about the background well through what Alexandra's written, um, then I can, um, my interest is looking at how various sorts of people dealt with that fatwa. Uh, in terms of their reasons for rejecting it, accepting it, what that led people to do. There were a number of efforts after this fatwa uh, that allowed, if those, for those of you who aren't, sorry, I don't know about this, that it, it, it didn't um, change uh, the norm against borrowing at interest, but it said under certain empirical conditions, Muslims who found themselves in a situation of, of darura could, uh, could take out a loan at interest. It then led to a number of people to say, well, we don't like that, so what are some other things we could do? We could come up with other, other forms of, uh, other ways of buying houses that don't involve interest. Um, I'm thinking within France. It led Suheb Hassan, who I mentioned earlier, to resign from the council for a while uh, and protest over that. Um, it led to all sorts of other, other things, which I can then trace sort of on the ground, right? So, but it's, it, it, these are sorts of, you know, building up an awareness of how the rather high-level deliberations about, um, you know, around IFTA and uh, particular local strategies uh, uh, interrelate. Um, this helps us think, I think, about leadership. Uh, the question earlier was about, uh, you know, who are the leaders? Well, it's not an easy question at all. If we think about that in terms of uh, fukaha, well, that's one level, right? But in the United States, all right, Hamza Yusuf, who was mentioned earlier as a leader, but, um, you know, in St. Louis, where I live, uh, the, the imam of the local mosque is a guy who comes out of an Urdu-speaking background. He's, uh, he's been in the U.S. A lot, a, a lot of the time. He refers any, any, any tricky divorce cases to a, to a council in Chicago, which is entirely Urdu-speaking. In fact, I'm going to meet with the sheikh uh, sometime soon, but I'll have to have a translator. He doesn't speak, doesn't speak English at all. Well, that's quite interesting, right? So what's the relation of this fellow to Hamza Yusuf or to uh, Taha Jabir Elwani in, in Herndon? If he's still in Herndon, is he still there right now? Who is a fascinating fellow? Very little. I mean, they're, 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 they're all tracing pathways in very complicated ways, right? So yes, the Ingrid Madison and Istan, all that's one face of Islam, but there's all sorts of other complicated things going on um, in the US. So to speak about the leadership, it takes us a long time, but it also takes um, a number of us, I think, working together at different levels to unpack what we might uh, mean by that. And I might just say, you know, Alexandra and I cite each other in our respective publications because we realize the value of uh, the work we're doing on similar object, but, you know, with very different sets of expertise. And I think that's, that's the way we build up this knowledge over time is a number of us doing this. Thank you. This was a wonderful panel. And please thank the uh, speakers with me. And we come to the conclusion of the conference in a few minutes. Thanks. Yeah, I will not uh, summarize the, uh, the conference because it was uh, too rich and too diverse, you know, to be just uh, put in a, a, a short sum up. Um, I will uh, just highlight some uh, points and possibly some conclusions. Uh, first, about this conference. Uh, uh, the problem we have, I think, in the uh, uh, academic world 
is that the studies of, uh, of uh, the study of Islam, or more exactly, I would say, the studies on Muslims are divided into two specific uh, disciplines, uh, which may not be exactly the same in the USA and uh, uh, in Europe. But uh, so we have sociology. In the USA, it's mainly sociology of minorities. In Europe, sociology of immigration. Uh, we have political science, of course, which tend more and more to uh, blur uh, with uh, uh, sociology, by the way. Uh, the study of uh, uh, Islam uh, as a uh, contemporary issue is also dealt with the Middle East, uh, East uh, uh, study centers, you know, who, of course, focus you know, on the uh, um, uh, Middle East mm, and tend, by definition, you know, to uh, consider that Muslims outside the Middle East are some sort of a diaspora, mm -hmm, uh, which is supposed to, uh, 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 to echo you know, uh, the conflicts and the debates of the uh, uh, Middle East. And then we have uh, uh, scholars on Islamic law, which, uh, who until recently used to work you know, more in some sort of uh, uh, historical framework, you know, uh, 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 working with the, uh, uh, the centers on religions or on history and things like that. And now these uh, scholars on Islamic law are more and more uh, integrated into the law schools. Mm. Uh, uh, so the idea was to, to get outside you know, these uh, divisions uh, in uh, disciplines and to bring uh, 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 people from the diverse, uh, this, uh, diverse, diverse institutions uh, uh, together. Uh, the focus is was uh, uh, mainly on uh, the courts, of course, you know, the way Western courts, uh, but not, not only Western, you, see, you said, uh, uh, contribute to uh, uh, formate, integrate, accommodate, or reject, you know. Uh, uh, what is uh, 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 seen as uh, Islamic norms. So that was the reason of the focus of this conference. But it's a long-term project. Mm. Uh, and uh, the idea is precisely to study, uh, I wouldn't say not so much Islam, but uh, Muslims uh, as believers, you know, not Muslims as some sort of a cultural minority or abstract uh, uh, sociological entity, but uh, uh, Muslims as believers. You know in a global uh, perspective. Hmm. Uh, and it's just a step in the uh, uh, long-term uh, uh, project. Uh, if I may draw uh, some conclusions from uh, this uh, 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 conference, first I think that the, the issue of formatting, the, the term may be uh, uh, accepted or not, that we, we may debate the, the term, but uh, the issue of formatting has been largely uh, dealt uh, uh, with. The way uh, how Islamic norms are understood or not, hmm, recast or reject, uh, uh, translated, if we can say that, uh, adapted, uh, uh, isolated, uh, uh, redefined, you know, uh, in uh, the, not only uh, uh, in courts, but also uh, through uh, the daily practices of uh, uh, Muslims. And this process of formatting is not new, of course, uh, in the history of religions. Uh, we can speak of the formatting of Judaism and Catholicism, for instance, in the USA uh, during the 19th century, mm -hmm. the Americanization of Catholicism, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of Judaism, so the uh, 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 Reformed Judaism and even Conservative Judaism are product you know, of this formatting of uh, 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 traditional Judaism uh, uh, in a uh, context, uh, not only of minority, of course, uh, but of uh, uh, integration in uh, Western uh, society. Uh, and we, so we, we could make very interesting comparisons, and some of the, uh, have been made by uh, uh, some speakers. Uh, just to, to see the, the complexity of this process of formatting. It could be more or less imposed. So the, and uh, as I said uh, yesterday, uh, uh, societies with a, a strong state tradition, like France, for instance, tend you know, to uh, format their religions in a rather authoritarian way you know, uh, by letting little choices mm, uh, to the believers. They conform or not, or at least that's the theory. In fact, the practices are uh, far more complex, as we, uh, as we said. 
uh, this process of formatting could come from some sort of negotiations, you know. Uh, just trying, you know, to understand, uh, as it has been said uh, uh, also uh, this morning, uh, there is a, a marriage contract. Uh, uh, it's a contract which has a legal value. How to understand? Hmm? How to frame it uh, in uh, compatible terms with uh, not only uh, the, the law, but also uh, the way uh, 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 social relations are uh, uh, understood. And this is something which is very important. Because here it's not just the legal definition of a marriage, but also the social uh, perception of what a marriage is. You know? And uh, this is a, a, a huge uh, debate. Uh, and also this formatting could be uh, uh, done by the actors themselves, you know, who try, more or less I would say uh, 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 deliberately, uh, but uh, who try to present their faith as compatible. You know? Uh, as uh, uh, sharing uh, 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 common values hmm? on the family, for instance, you know? uh, on uh, the good, hmm? uh, on uh, uh, war and peace, uh, things like that, you know, to, to, uh, uh, to show uh, that uh, uh, we share uh, uh, common values, even if uh, the uh, uh, theological basis, if I can say that, uh, uh, are uh, quite different. So, uh, and I think that this uh, formatting is working, you know, is working. Uh, 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 it goes uh, with conflict, it goes with misunderstanding, it needs time, uh, it's roughly uh, 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 working. Uh, and we have, it's done at, uh, as I said, the level of different practices, hmm? not only courts, but also just people in the streets. Hmm? And we see now the uh, emerging of uh, the, rising, uh, the rise of uh, new actors. And here there is still a problem, you know, of who is the legitimate actor, who is uh, 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 well, the people who can say, uh, we can speak, uh, uh, we can say what is an acceptable uh, 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 formatted, if I can say that, norm. Uh, traditional ulamas are more and more dealing with the issue because they realize that. Uh, uh, it's a matter of being in or out. If you don't uh, uh, think about that, uh, and many examples have been uh, given by John Bowen, for instance. Uh, 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 but the, uh, the problem of the uh, traditional ulama is uh, that they have, uh, I would say, a problem of a, a, a terminology, of how to uh, 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 shift from a, a traditional uh, uh, Islamic scholar terminology to uh, an understandable uh, terminology, a terminology which can be used by uh, 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 a judge uh, in a Western court, for instance. You know, not just used, but understood. You know. And here we have the issue of the, the translators, if I can say that, the go-between. You know. More and more, uh, 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 so we have the, uh, the, the well-known figure of the, the expert. You know, and uh, 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 as it has been said, uh, there is a lot of money to do uh, in that. You know, there is a market for expertise, which had some uh, negative also side e effect, you know, because to be an expert is uh, more and more uh, an occupation in itself. Uh, uh, and you speak uh, uh, as an expert, uh, this means that you speak at somebody who has to deliver uh, uh, a practical uh, a receipt, you know, a solution to a given problem. Uh, so we have traditional ulamas who uh, now more and more come to the West, uh, uh, try to speak to the West, but cannot, for example, speak on the TV. Uh, uh, if you, Sher uh, Karadawi would probably not, uh, 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 well, uh, will not do well uh, on CNN. Uh, uh, it depends, of course, on uh, from which perspective uh, you say doing well. You know, from his own perspective, maybe. You know, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, it will certainly not be perceived by the majority of the listeners as a, a, a positive approach to integration. Mm -hmm. Although uh, it is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so we have also self-appointed intellectuals mm -hmm. uh, who. Uh, uh, tend to present themselves as reformers of Islam. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, they are, uh, they are often given, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, st the stage, if I can say that, because uh, for different reasons, uh, many people in the West are convinced that the formatting process could be done only uh, if there is a theological reformation of Islam, which I don't believe, but that's another story. Hmm. So we have new actors. We have uh, more and more new spaces, you know, and I think for the GTU here, the Zaytuna, uh, uh, we have new institutions now uh, where uh, uh, thinking, you know, uh, uh, is uh, taking place by, uh, I would say, uh, 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 looking on both sides of this uh, formatting, both sides of this uh, 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 formatting uh, 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 process. Uh, but, but formatting does not always work. And here, uh, I go back to the uh, discussion with Peter Dunshin, uh, uh, with uh, Weinstock on um, uh, uh, the liberal state. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the problem is the exception. But roughly speaking, it works. You know. uh, even if we, of course, tend to focus to uh, uh, the, the, uh, the problems. Uh, take the example of the uh, uh, Danish cartoons, for instance. Uh, too often, we, the media, for instance, tend to say that there was, there was a huge uproar and demonstration in the Muslim world. Right? The Muslims did demonstrate. Where? In Paris. Mm. We had 700 you know, Muslim demonstrators against the Danish cartoons, and they didn't burn one car. So, nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, the most, I would say, uh, 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 tough demonstration was in London, as usual. Mm. Uh, but uh, uh, almost nothing did happen in, in the West. No, against the, uh, Cartes, uh, uh, Danish cartoons. The demonstration took place for different reasons in Gaza Strip, in Damascus, in Morocco, and in Pakistan, as always, yeah, as usual. Yeah. So we have always the two poles of uh, radicalization, London and Islamabad. Yeah. Well, uh, the suburbs of Islamabad. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, we uh, have uh, this, uh, uh, you know, there was no uh, an uprising of the Muslim war, you know, uh, in favor of a fatwa to kill uh, the, uh, uh, the guys who uh, drew uh, the uh, uh, cartoons. So, we have also this uh, self-working narrative uh, of uh, the clash of the Muslim world, which in fact is not uh, 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 just uh, supported by facts. Mm. Uh, but still, uh, there are people who don't play uh, uh, along the rules. Mm. And here we have the predicament of the liberal state, which uh, what do we do, you know, uh, when uh, autonomy conflicts uh, uh, with freedom and freedom of speech conflicts with uh, freedom of uh, religion. So when we have this conflict of uh, uh, rights. And there is something uh, uh, interesting because uh, it's often presented as inherent, you know, as an inherent problem in any liberal state. But if we look, for instance, at the uh, First Amendment uh, of the uh, uh, US uh, Constitution, we can see that all these con uh, conflicting rights are presented, in fact, as the same thing. You know? Uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Which means, and if you look now at the uh, uh, cases in courts, usually when you have a, a conflict involving religion, mm -hmm, one of the sides will uh, 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 claim for separation of church and state, and the other side will claim, uh, will base uh, its claim on freedom of religion. So in many uh, uh, court cases, freedom of religion and the clause of non-establishment are presenting as a comp uh, uh, in competition, concurring against each, uh, each other. But obviously, I am not an expert uh, in his, uh, US history, in constitutional law, and things like that. But for me, you know, it was obvious that for the founding fathers, there was no contradiction. If there were a contradiction, they would not, not have put, you know, the two principles in the same sentence. So, what went wrong? How is it that something which was not seen as a problem uh, uh, at that time is seen as a problem? 
And I think that the issue is not that the state ha has changed, is it is religion which has uh, uh, changed. Uh, there is, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, religion, or at least, I would not say religion as such, but believers, faithful people, you know, are seen as disrupting the social cohesion. Faith is seen, not religion as such, uh, faith is seen, obvious faith, uh, uh, faith is seen as uh, uh, disruptive. And it's an argument which is often used, you know, about the Scarf Affair, for instance, you know, uh, uh, um, or about the Eruv, uh, the uh, thread, you know, in Montreal around uh, 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 Lubavitch neighborhood, uh, uh, to make this neighborhood, uh, 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 well, uh, some sort of a home, you know, uh, for the uh, Shabbat. Uh, uh, the argument of the religious people is, why do you care? And it was exactly the debate uh, uh, yesterday. Why do you care? And the atheist or the non-believers or just the other guy say, I do care. You know, uh, uh, your religious beliefs are some sort of um, a problem for me. Uh, uh, and that, that's new. That's new. So what, is, uh, uh, what does it mean? It means that now religion is seen uh, as uh, outside the social bound. That, that religion is not seen as part of the social cohesion. But it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, uh, this or that religion is more of a problem. But what we can see, if we look at uh, which religions are we referring to, we are looking at different forms of religion. Uh, uh, the first amendment of the Constitution didn't make problem for uh, 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 Lutheran, Episcopalians, Methodists. Uh, it does make problem for uh, 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 evangelicalists, uh, and especially some uh, 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 brand of uh, 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 born again evangelicalists. They have a problem, and they say it by the way, they have a problem with the separation of church and state, uh, uh, which was not the case for the founding fathers. We would have known you know, if they had a problem uh, uh, with that. Uh, so the religions which are making problems now are not religions as such, they are forms of religion. Uh, it's the Salafi version of Islam, for instance, or the Wahhabi call it as you, as you want, uh, it's Lubavitch uh, 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 for the uh, 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 conservative uh, Jews, it's evangelicalism or Pentecostalism, or it's the, the, the cults, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses and so. So uh, 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 the problem is that uh, the, um, the, the form of religion which are now uh, uh, creating this sort of, not creating, but uh, 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 at the center of this uh, 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 anxiety, I would say, about the social bond are not traditional forms of religion. Mm. Which means, and it brings me to uh, 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 my uh, uh, last point, uh, that it's the deculturation of religion, uh, the loss of the uh, social and cultural evidence of religion which has a, a disruptive effect. And my last point uh, about that is that in this sense, there is no difference between Western Islam and some sort of uh, traditional Islam or Islam in traditional uh, Muslim societies. This phenomena of the deculturation of religion is taking place everywhere. Uh, and here I'm not referring as, well, I would say uh, what we could call uh, occasional uh, uh, practitioners, people who used to go sometime uh, to the mosque or the church or synagogue. No, I'm referring to born again and converts. No. Uh, the, uh, the forms of religions which make problems now are uh, uh, these forms of religions, are born again and uh, 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 converts, uh, who explicitly put into question uh, the evidence of the uh, social bond and who consider that the surrounding culture is not religious. So I would say in a traditional uh, uh, society, even a uh, Western liberal state uh, or uh, whatever you want, there was a cont cultural continuity between the believer and the non-believer. They used to share the same values. Uh, and uh, even in secularist France, you know, uh, uh, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, uh, 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 the ultra-secularist and the Catholic Church, they had many values in common. The family, uh, the idea that uh, there is a gender inequality, uh, 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 definition of morality, uh, integrity, and things like that were common. Uh, what uh, uh, is lost is precisely this uh, 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 cultural common ground. Uh, and religion now is not uh, a part of a, 
a, a culturally accepted system of values, it is seen as having its own separate set of uh, values. And this is a big problem for the Pope, for instance, who uh, always stress the fact that religion and culture should go together, that uh, uh, religions are always embedded into given cultures, and that given cultures should have a religious soul, you know, like the uh, European culture. But it doesn't work. You know. And the, the Pope is lamenting that the Western culture has lost its soul, and its soul is the Catholic Church. And yes, yes, they lost it. You know. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, and even in uh, uh, Muslim societies, we have this recasting of true Islam as a minority you know, among a more or less culturally Muslim country. Uh, the, uh, the narrative of minority is very interesting. And even in countries where the population consider it itself as Muslim, Egypt and Pakistan, for instance. The, uh, I will not say the extremists, the vocabulary is not, uh, 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 we should not use a political vocabulary. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, the fundamentalists, we can say that, the people who say we want to, to return back to the fundamentals, you know. Uh, so fundamentalists in the Protestant sense uh, uh, of the term, back to the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. They do consider that there are a minority in a society whose culture is largely profane and even pagan, you know. Paganism, paganism is a word, you know, used to uh, uh, speak about uh, the uh, surrounding uh, society. It's interesting to see how some uh, radical splinter group, for instance, will explicitly use, uh, qualify themselves as a small minority, uh, saved from the hell, for instance, the name of a group uh, uh, in Egypt. Uh, recently, uh, um, uh, an Ashi song, you know, a uh, 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 song which is uh, uh, done a cappella without uh, uh, a music instrument, had a lot of success in internet. And the, uh, uh, the song is Horaba. And uh, the, uh, the story is uh, uh, Islamic militant uh, was sentenced recently, uh, some years ago, by an Egyptian court. And uh, uh, as the Egyptian court, like the Italian court, you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, some sort of a small jail. You know. uh, and and uh, when the guy was sentenced to death or uh, to uh, uh, life uh, in jail, he began to sing, you know. And a very beautiful song, by the way, Horaba. And what is the meaning of the song? Horaba is the strangers. But the strangers, he said, we are the strangers. You know. We are strangers in this world, you know. Mm. Uh, and think, uh, I think that the, the, the issue is there, you know. It's not so much a crisis of the liberal state, it's that new forms of religiosity now tend to consider that, in fact, a true believer is a stranger yeah. uh, uh, and should not meddle too much, should not be under the influence of, uh, uh, of the culture, uh, because the culture uh, is no more uh, religious and maybe uh, a culture cannot be religious. You have to live in a true culture. So I think that the, the, the problem we have is it's not an existential problem of the relationship between state and religion. It's more some sort of a transitory problem, a confrontation with new forms of religion. And why it's a transitory problem? I'm a very optimistic on that. I think for very simple reasons, it's very difficult to be born from a born again. You know. uh, when you are born from a born again, what you receive is a tradition. So you will never uh, escape tradition and culture, and the culture will make a comeback uh, uh, to a certain extent. So it's why uh, uh, I am uh, optimistic, but I think we have still uh, work to do on that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.